from the place where the good guy is always dressed in black. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson, and I am joined by my co-host, my partner in crime. He is the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. How the hell are you, man? I'm doing great, Munson. And how are my wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody's doing great. Looking forward to some live wrestling action that's going to start happening. Papa Smokes, we're getting towards the end of this pandemic, finally. <laughs> Fans are going to be in arenas. We know the announcement came from MLW. Um, I mean, we don't talk about them much on the show, but even AEW's announced that they're going to get back to live touring with fans in the arena coming up around uh, July. So it looks like this is going to push forward with a lot of different wrestling companies. And hopefully here in Canada, we're not too far off it ourselves. So hopefully some announcements will be coming soon for some live wrestling action uh, coming back to our provinces right here in Canada. Yeah, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. It's been far too long to be away from live wrestling. Yeah, you bet, man. Looking forward to it once again. Looking forward to being able to go and have beers with my uh, video bro and co-host here, Papa Smokes. It's been way too damn long, man, since the end of 2020, since we were able to sit down and have a good old beer and talk some wrestling live. But we'll get back to it soon enough. In the meantime, before we get started here today, I'm going to ask you to go and click the subscribe button down below. Turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on Ring Respect Radio on the Video Bros Network. You can also go check us out on Backbreaker Media on YouTube, on Podbean, and anywhere else that you can find Backbreaker Media, and also through the Canadian Wrestling Network as well. Our great friends over there have been doing great things, pushing Ring Respect Radio. Thank you very much to all the help and everybody who tunes in each and every week. Much appreciated from the both of us. So Pop Smokes, we're going to be doing this one more time. We're coming up to the season finale of MLW Fusion before they go back and go to live fans as of July 10th at the big show that's coming up there for them. In the meantime, we got two more episodes of MLW Fusion to go over, recap, review. So we got the second to last and the season finale as well. Some big stuff going down, a lot to talk about. So we might as well get started with the first thing on MLW Fusion episode 130. Started off the night with a little bit of a video package that they do each and every week for uh, leading up to the main event. This one showing the history between Marshall Von Erich, Tom Lawler, as always, a great kickstart to every MLW Fusion episode that really pumps that main event for the fans watching at home. Yeah, yeah, and they uh, this had been a huge feud for MLW back in 2019, pitting the Von Erich brothers against uh, Tom Lawler and Team Filthy, and of course, as we know, uh, everything kind of got interrupted a uh, quarter of the way through 2020, so this feud, they're kind of uh, resurrecting it to there's been injuries, there's been bad blood all throughout this, and uh, it still isn't settled yet. So we get more uh, Team team Filthy versus the Von Erichs. Yeah, and we're going to get both in singles competition here tonight on episode 130. Uh, starting off with the very first match of the evening, we're going to get Ross Von Erich taking on Dominic Garini of Violence is Forever, Team Filthy. Uh, they're going to go one-on-one. -on -one. Man, we've talked about the Von Erichs in one-on-one -on -one competition a few times here on Ring Respect Radio in the past. Weren't sure what to expect from the Von Erickson singles competition. And I know as soon as I watched this matchup in particular, and then all through to the end, which we'll get to, my mind was really changed on the Von Erickson singles competitors, especially I had a really turn of heart on Ross Von Erick in this matchup, Pop Smokes. I really liked the Matt grappling and stuff. I liked his look coming into this. He looks like he's gotten an even better physical shape um, starting to look more and more like a star every day. Ross Von Eric really kicking ass in this one. Yeah, I thought so too. Uh, again, with the injury to Marshall Von Eric, he was not going to be having the tag team matches. In fact, he does have a, a, a singles match in his show, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I, I got to agree with you, Ross Von Eric, looking like a star, handsome, great body, isn't totally uh, comfortable in the ring or completely natural in the ring yet uh, but I, I think this guy's a future star he's got baby baby face idol written all over him and uh, I thought this was a great uh, solo outing yeah and you know what and it was a much better outing from Dominic Garini at the same time too I thought I saw a little bit more from him that I found enjoyable in this matchup I think the two of them worked well together too uh, so well put together matchup that ended up giving Ross Von Eric that win. If this is the start of a singles run for Ross Von Eric uh, past this whole uh, 
shut down before we restart MLW again back in July. I mean, I could see this going really well for him, uh, given the time. Again, MLW is all about giving the time, letting these guys develop and stuff like that. There is a lot of potential here with Ross on Eric that I noticed after this, this encounter. Yeah, I think so. And I imagine the same thing is true of Marshall Von Eric as well. I mean, these guys could probably have uh, equally good singles careers, but uh, kind of going off the traditional uh, uh, feelings of their uh, uncles and their dad, who were the who were always uh, a lot did a lot of tag team action anyway. And I think it's a good way to introduce both boys, uh, depending on what uh, they end up doing eventually, uh, having them in a tag team together is a good way to kind of get them started and get the get both their fo- uh, feet in the door in this business. Yeah, so great kickoff to MLW Fusion 130. Uh, did no harm Dominic Garini in this match. I mean, I, I think this was almost an expectation that Ross Von Erich would go over in this particular encounter. Uh, so great for Ross Von Erich in that sense. Uh, Dominic Garini, again, still developing. Uh, Going to be... Somebody interesting to watch as he goes along, especially once he gets more uh, opportunities in that ring under his belt. So on both ends, great, great encounter, great matchup, great start to the night. Uh, From there, we went on to PWI's investigation of El Jefe. And we were talking prior to this show going on uh, live here that uh, we had a bit of a chuckle when we saw this uh, PWI investigation. Uh, In between the list, in the middle was uh, Tony Khan was one of the names. Had to have a laugh about that because you got to know if PWI is having a little bit of a joke or had to find somebody else they could throw in there out of interest. But we've been saying it all along. Dario Cueto or Conan, these were the two. I've been saying Dario Cueto, you've been saying Conan, both with great reason. And it looks like PWI are onto the same things here, Papa Smoke. So clearly El Jefe, who we'll talk about later on, is going to be one of those two guys. I think it's set in stone at this point. Yeah, yeah, we were dead on with that too. There, there wasn't going to be too many possibilities, I suppose. But uh, we settled on a on the two uh, that their suggestion of Tony Khan is quite hilarious. I'm sure a little chuckle for the readers, and I got one out of that too. Yeah, sure was, man. So it's going to be interesting. We will find out more about El Jefe coming up in the next episode. So we will get to that. Not going to spend too much time at the moment. Going to be lots to talk about later on. So. Backstage, right after this segment, we went straight to Tom Lawler in the back with Kevin Koo and Dominic Garini, just laying into them for basically shaming him, making him look like a fool, coming up short in the matchup. And then suddenly he kind of breaks down as a change of heart, says it's it's not their fault. And they got to figure out what to do for later on with the Marshall Von Eric matchup coming up. And all of a sudden the light goes on. Tom Lawler's got an idea that he whispers to the boys. Something is something dirty is going on here, Papa Smokes. He's got something up his sleeve. He's got his phone out. He's making a call, and uh, that's gonna end up no good, as we know. Tom Lawler, he'll he'll look for a cheap way to win all the time, and uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled on the screen for what happens. We sure will. So from there, uh, yeah. After that, I think we went to a bit of a commercial break, and then as soon as we come back from that, or I think it was a video package, actually. I believe. Sorry about that. Uh, and then we come back and we do find out what Tom Waller has a little up his sleeve. He goes to talk to referee Tim Don- Donahue, I believe his name is. And we all know that Tim Donahue, the guy who s- fixed that matchup, the Richard Holiday finally secured the Caribbean Championship, also known for his uh, fixing of matchups back in his days as a basketball referee as well, too. Now, Tom Waller offering it up something in an envelope to pull some sort of trick here. I don't know what's going on, man, but there's a, we, like we said before, it's dirty and we know Tom Waller will stop at nothing and make sure he wins tonight. And if you're going to do something dirty like that on a wrestling show, you have to do it with the camera crew there, right? We all know that. And uh, yeah, yeah. We're going to see in the ring what goes on here uh, or backstage at MLW and, and Lawler up to no good all the time. Yeah, you bet he is, man. And, We'll see more of that coming up. So we went back to in-ring action, though. We got a matchup. Hio de la Park, D, sorry, Hio de LA Park, sorry, versus Buku Dao. We talked about much on the show, getting his push here. Uh, the successful over TJP in that feud. Now a big match against one half of the tag team champions. But there's a lot at stake here as well, too. Not just 
an opportunity for Buku Dao to push himself further, but opportunity for Selena to redeem herself in the eyes of El Jefe. They've been saying about how she's gone into business for herself. This was her opportunity to make good in El Jefe's mind again. And opportunity abound and not picked up. Buku Dao picking up a very surprise win in what was, I, I thought, a very enjoyable match again here. Uh, these two worked quite well together. And I really got to see more of Hio de LA Park. And man, I'm really starting to enjoy him more and more. Yeah, yeah. It, he's only in some of their uh, tag team matches, but be, being that they're a three man team. So we don't get to see uh, all the guys all the time. And uh, this was pretty good. Uh, uh, Hiho de LA Park was was doing a lot of posing and posturing. I, th I think he underestimated Buku Dao and was. Uh, overconfident that he was going to win this match. And then uh, with Buku Dao pulling out the win in this singles match, it kind of almost begs the question if, if he had, and TJP had still been a team and had the match against Lost Parks, we could have maybe seen new tag team champions here. You never know. So uh, this push for Buku Dao continues and uh, looking good, actually looking really good. Yeah. He's picked up some big wins here. I mean, you got to say uh, TJP and he owed to LA Park now, who's one half of a tag team champions. This really has got to escalate Buku Dao, especially going into next season of MLW Fusion. I'd imagine this guy, especially if maybe in the middleweight category, is going to get quite a bit of a push and going to start uh, maybe looking at possibly going after that middleweight championship down the road. Yeah, yeah. I think the sky's the limit for uh, Dao and, and, He's uh, starting out here in his first big company, and uh, yeah, he needs some ring work and he needs some promo work and all that. But that that will come, and, and that'll come along. He's uh, if he stays in MLW, it sounds like he's going to be on TV a whole lot, so uh, he's going to get that experience. And I'm looking forward to see seeing uh, what they do with him and and if he can pick up some gold in MLW. Yeah, be interesting to see. It's good to see that they're really pushing behind someone that they think has that potential, someone they'd like to make a star before somebody else gets that opportunity to do so. Uh, nice to see this guy kind of from the start. We're really getting to see just the first opportunities for Buku Dao here and many years to come. This guy's a young man. He's going to have many, many years of great wrestling ahead of him. So happy to see him get in this position. But we got to talk about the consequences now because with Hio de LA Park picking up a loss despite a great effort from him in this matchup, now Selena De La Renta has got to be in some serious uh, serious trouble with El Jefe. He is not going to be a happy man after this encounter. Yeah, that that's for sure. And she's already been in hot water with Azteca Underground and El Jefe, so he in a lot more now. And I noticed one of the things about this match with Hijo de L.A. Park is that he didn't have his crew with him. Uh, you know how much those guys uh, in the tag team matches rely on that third man and the outside interference and all the rest of it. He came out to the ring by himself this time and took the loss. It, it kind of says something about the maybe the longevity or the long-term strength of the tag team champions. Yeah, you bet, man. So it's a lot to decipher there, and we're going to find out even more about the situation with Selena De La Renta. She will end up having to you know, answer to El Jefe, and we'll see how that pans out. Uh, we were promised a media event was going to be taking place on this episode of MLW Fusion, a media event between Leo Rush and Myron Reed, leading up to the Reed Rush 2 matchup going to main event MLW Fusion next week as the season finale of the show. But we find out breaking news, Leo Rush didn't make the plane, isn't going to be there. There will be no media event at all because he will not be involved and then, yeah, so not not really a surprise. It almost kind of comes across as a typical heel move before not to give out what the fans expect or what people have been told to believe. It really gives uh, Leo a little bit more edge as the heel going into this because definitely Myron Reed has been pushed as the baby face. So I think it's quite clear who's on which side going into this uh, second encounter with these two. Yeah, and this is right up the uh, alley of, of how Leo Rush is playing his heel character and that he's too big for MLW. He's a multimedia star. He's a rapper. He's a music star uh, and, and everything else. So this is good heel tactics, in my opinion, uh, not showing up for anything, getting the $5,000 fine, not caring about that. He's rich. He's a rap star. He doesn't care. And, uh, and uh, 
Yeah, that's just the way it goes with a, a, a sort of a arrogant, rich heel character like that. I'm not sure if this is something that actually happened that he didn't make this uh, media thing. But uh, at any rate, to me, it just kind of uh, boosts his uh, his heel persona. It sure does. So uh, right after this, uh, we go to more breaking news from MLW and this one about uh, big signing here um, and, and a different type of sign. We're not talking about the signing of a competitor or an announcer or anything like this. We're talking about the signing of a championship committee that's being put together. MLW going to be working with Dragon Gate, uh, AAA also announced, uh, Rev, uh, Rev Pro in the UK, all going to be part of this championship committee to oversee championships being uh, floated around between the different companies and everything. Also the exchange of different talents. Um, it hasn't been officially announced, but we have heard the rumor that uh, MLW and NXT might be talking about doing a so, some sort of thing there as well, too. So I wonder if that will also play into Rev Pro, AAA, Dragon Gate, all these different companies. There could be a lot of things opening up for many big talents and stuff like that being used in a proper way and being able to explore different options for themselves and many opportunities for great big matchups to be presented to us, the fans, on many different platforms. Pop Smokes, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, it's interesting the way they're doing it. I remember uh, in the glory days in the 70s and 80s, uh, every large Fed used to have a championship committee, whether it was uh, kayfabe or not, uh, if it actually existed or not. But uh, it was usually to uh, have a committee to decide uh, on number one contenders and title shots and title payoffs and, and other uh, federation business like that. I haven't seen or heard of a championship committee in a federation being brought up in a, in a long time, in, in many years now. So it's interesting that they're doing this. Um, I have a feeling that this uh, championship committee is, uh, like you said, also going to be doing some work towards uh, cross-promotional uh, booking and, and uh, that kind of thing too. So uh, interesting. I'll be, uh, I'll be fascinated to hear some of the names that come up on this. And uh, I'm sure there'll be someone from AAA Lucha and uh, somebody from uh, the various other uh, federations that they're working with. And uh, yeah, it should be interesting that, I'm just uh, liking anything that uh, strengthens MLW as an organization. And uh, it looks like they're doing really good. And this is just another piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so much going on for them. And this, again, like you said, one more piece of the puzzle. There's so much more to unfold about this whole situation and then some about the situation going on over in MLW. And it's all positive. Everything they've got going on is a complete positive, not only for them, but for us as the fans as well, too, continuing to basically you know, go out there and find more opportunity to bring us great pro wrestling that looks like sport-based wrestling and being able to do so the way it used to be able to be done, you know, making us interested in tuning in each and every week to these programs and opening up. So maybe we currently haven't reached out and watched a Dragon Gate event or a AAA event or Rev Pro event for that matter at the moment. But that could change when you start to see names that you become familiar with, with a show like MLW Fusion, go over and have these matchups with guys that you hear about over in Rev Pro or AAA or something. There's more interest in wanting to seek those shows out or be able to pay them, you know, a fee on Fight TV or something like that to be able to go and watch some of these big cards that could be created by these championship committees that are being put together. Very exciting in my mind. Yeah, well put, Munson. It's it's only going to lead to better things. Yeah. So from there, uh, we go to, I believe, uh, the next thing is uh, them talking about the consequence for Selena De La Renta with El Jefe. We touched on that a little bit already, so we'll move on from there. Uh, after that, we had Alicia Toot backstage with Marshall Vaughn Eric doing an interview talking about the main event tonight, uh, getting all pumped for <clears> it, when all of a sudden interrupted by filthy Tom Waller. Now the plan's starting to unfold here. He comes in saying that Marshall Vaughn, Eric, obviously has got to be taking something because he's definitely not natural. He wants him to take a piss test, Papa Smokes, and this uh, really uh, re really uh, boils up the blood of Marshall Vaughn, Eric. He's not too happy about Tom Waller's plan here. Yeah, and yet how quickly he went along with it. And uh, I had the feeling that uh, he had something up his sleeve here and didn't that turn out to be a nice comic moment? <laughs> yeah, sure it did. So the um, point that you're making there is uh, later on when the uh, Tom Lawler having the interview, 
Marshall comes back in, the test has been taken or whatever. Sorry, it wasn't Marshall that came in, but uh, somebody else came in, did they not? I, I'm trying to recall here. Donahue. Yeah, the referee, Donahue. There we go. Yeah, Donahue was the one that returned there. And yeah, and then uh, Tom Waller got a taste of his own medicine in that case. <laughs> yeah, literally a taste, yeah. Very much so, yeah. So that was uh, quite quite entertaining. And then uh, right after that one, uh, we went to another interview. We had Myron Reed. This is probably where the media event would have taken place. So Myron Reed getting the opportunity to speak, uh, basically calling Leo Rush out, saying that just he does not have what it takes to face him, that he's, you know, cowardly, that, you know, he's not prepared to go up against the young goat this time. Like, that is this Myron Reed sounded more ready than Myron Reed sounded going into their last encounter. Man, this one's going to be awesome. They built this one up as a big thing. It's going to be presented as a big thing next week. I'm excited. This this helped. I really liked Myron Reed's promo here, Papa Smokes. Yeah, I also did too. Uh, this was fiery. This was emotional. He brought it out from the inside himself. He, he said, last time, Leo Rush, you beat me just by a hair. And this time I know what I did wrong and I'm not going to lose to you again. I refuse to lose to you again. And those are nice, strong words. This is what we want to hear from our competitors. They want the match. They want the, the violence and the contact and the holds and everything else. They want the action in the ring. And, and his refusal to lose just had to get you behind Myron Reed. And he's getting better at the promos. He's getting really good here. He, he uses his real emotion from inside and it shows that makes a great promo. Yeah. And this was one of his best yet. I really enjoyed it. Pumped this up. It's a great thing because it's a main event matchup next week. So you got to make it seem like a main event type matchup. Now it does definitely in my mind. So we're looking forward to that one on the next episode of MLW fusion. Right after that, Alicia Toot back with another interview this time with your boy hammer. He's talking about uh, everything that he's been able to do with that uh, op uh, open weight championship and the national open weight championship, how great he's done with it and everything like that. What's next for him? That's the big question. And you know, what's next. He wants Jacob fought to, but Yosef Samael won't let him have it. We know that Yosef Samael has been protecting Jacob fought or holding back this matchup for so long. It just makes us eagerly want it that much more every single time it gets brought up. And that's what they keep teasing Papa Smokes. And we're going to continue to get that tease by the sounds of it. Uh, we're going to find out even more about that on the next episode. So we won't dig too deep here, but again, is there anything much more to add to Hammerstone's promos? I mean, he nails them. He, he delivers what he needs to deliver. He sounded better and better and he's making us want this match more and more. Yeah, totally great. I mean, we heard we've heard Joseph Samuel say, I, "I'm gatekeeping this championship. I'm the one that decides who gets a shot, who doesn't, who's in consideration for a shot, and who isn't." But I like the what Hammerstone said is that, "Hey, man, it's not Jacob Fatu that's scared of me. Jacob Fatu would love to get it on with me. It's Joseph Samuel that's afraid of me. That is afraid to lose that belt." Great point. Like great point made there, and. Uh, and now we kind of get a little peek into Contra's business is that, you know, just as they would, they, they've got a stranglehold on the, on the uh, world heavyweight championship in ML, MLW and they don't want to give it up. They'll do anything to keep that belt around Fatu's waist, including working behind his back to, to protect him from certain challengers that might be able to beat him. Very smart, very psychological. And I, I like both these guys in their promos, uh, a beauty from Hammerstone and uh, Sam Ale, always, always excellent in his. Yeah, it's going to lead up to one hell of a matchup when it finally does happen. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day we'll get there, but uh, not just yet. Uh, from there, we had, uh, let's have a look here. Uh, it looks like, oh, uh, yeah, again, we talked about it. So we're right on to the main event, I guess, Papa Smoke. Sorry, uh, looking at my notes here. We're back to in-ring action for one-on-one. -on -one. Filthy Tom Lawler taking on Marshall Von Eric. Man, this matchup, Papa Smokes, <laughs> these two tore into each other quite well. Man, does Filthy Tom Waller know how to put on a matchup, especially one where he's focusing on the injury of uh, Marshall Von Eric. We knew that was going to be a factor. Continuing to attack that knee, grind it down, putting hold after hold. But they sold Marshall Von Eric's heart, his tenacity, his will to never give up no matter what. I mean, he fought back hard. There's a few times we thought that he had 
Tom Lawler beat. He really had that fight brought to him. And unfortunately, it kept going, beat down, beat down, beat down until Tom Lawler put him in that lock, that leg lock, that knee lock there at the end and held it there until Marshall finally passed out. I couldn't have asked for a better way to end this matchup. Marshall Von Eric looks like a legitimate badass going into this and coming out of it. And Tom Lawler looks like maybe the most dangerous man on the planet after this is all said and done. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It wasn't this match beautifully booked and uh, also laid out too. Uh, you know, you could, you know, when you see the baby face coming to the ring with bandaged up uh, leg or arm in this case, the leg that there's going to be, uh, you know, that he, he's going to, he might not go over in this match and uh, might have the sympathy thing. That's kind of how they did it too. Is that uh, filthy Tom? Uh, imagine the. UFC veteran going after your injured leg for uh, nearly 12 minutes. I mean, this is this was just even uh, watching this match as a wrestling fan, veteran all my life. It had me cringing, and uh, and uh, I could feel it in my own leg the way he was working over that injured knee. And uh, this is the kind of reaction you want when the viewer can't even help himself, but kind of worry about the baby face's health a little bit you know, despite anything, you know, about professional wrestling. And uh, this was just great stuff. And uh, uh, obviously a lot of the match had Lawler uh, uh, working over uh, Von Eric's knee, but some of the comebacks were just very, very nicely done. Uh, at one point uh, Lawler had the guillotine choke on Marshall Von Eric, and then Marshall reaching up with the claw too, at the same time, putting Lawler in some distress as well. And, uh, Finally, uh, Lawler got that uh, single leg crab and uh, really leaned in on that. And uh, you could see Ross with the towel outside. I thought he might throw in the towel, but uh, eventually Marshall passing out from the from the pain of the uh, single leg crab. And like you said, now you have a baby face that looks even more heroic, even in a loss. And then you're uh, one of your top heels and uh, leader of a faction looking extremely tough and extremely evil in this match. I mean, what more could you want out of a TV match that's uh, still building a feud that's been going for a, a year and a half now? Uh, really great stuff. And, uh, and like you say, both grapplers coming out of this match looking much stronger than they did going in. Yeah. And I mean, like, I mean, the, the filthy Tom Lawler too, it's like he gets in there, he puts on this fantastic, amazing performance and stuff like that. And this was after he tried to pull all the dirty, heel tactics he could to weasel his way out of this thing and then he goes out there and proves that he's one of the toughest sons of bitches in the entire company and possibly in all professional wrestling today he went in there and yeah he healed it up focusing on that injury just beating it down and again you feel the sympathy for marshall again you're watching you're cringing and everything it means that they're doing their jobs right kind of thing and that's what we don't see enough of in pro wrestling these days is two guys working a match properly making you feel that psychology whether it's the hatred for tom lawler and his dirty tactics or that you know that little bit of desire to want to see marshall von eric get back and kick the shit out of him even though you know deep down it's going to be damn near impossible yeah yeah like i say nicely done a uh, well booked well laid out match really good they did the little uh, after match uh, run-ins with the uh, the rest of the team filthy running in for the beatdown on uh, the Von Ericks and then uh, ACH coming to their defense as the, uh, the fellow Texas guy that he is and uh, sometime a friend and helper of the Von Ericks. So we went off the air of this episode with a bunch of wild brawling, uh, just exactly what, uh, what they intended to do was just keep the fire under this feud uh, burning nice and hot and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have the uh, blow-off matches between uh, Team Filthy and the Von Ericks at some point in the future. Yeah, it's going to be going to be great when it finally happens. Uh, hopefully, that'll be sometime uh, shortly after this restart. Maybe this will give time for guys like Marshall Von Eric to heal that knee injury while he's off and uh, at home getting prepared for in-ring action once again. Uh, looking forward to when uh, things come back. But before we get there, we got one more episode to recap and review. MLW Fusion 131. This was the season finale, Papa Smokes. And man, did a lot go down. If we thought the last episode was 
interesting and fun and great and full of great matchups. This one was full of a lot of stuff. I don't you know. It might not have had the matches might not have been quite as strong as a whole. Every single match wasn't as strong as the previous episode, but as a whole episode, a lot to unpackage here. So let's uh, kick it off. We had again, the video package would start the night off rush and read video package that went down pumping up for this main event. Again, nothing more we can add. It's a great way to kick off MLW every week, lets you know what's going down at the end of the night, showing you what uh, led to this whole thing. And man, there's a lot there that happened between these guys. But let's get straight to the in-ring action. Gringo Loco, one of the most, uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what to say about Gringo Loco. I mean, he's there, the guy can move, he's got stuff. I just don't know if I can ever be a Gringo local fan on a personal level. <laughs> Apologies to him. It's not your efforts. It's just I'm not down with the character or what he does in the ring. Personally, it, it doesn't fly with me. Take on Laredo Kid, who, you know, I we've seen some great stuff from Laredo Kid. But the thing I found most unique about this is Laredo Kid came out with that AAA Cruiserweight Championship. And I hadn't read anything about this or heard anything about it. But apparently he did not concede the championship to Leo Rush after Leo Rush's big win, stating that Leo Rush had tapped out in the matchup and they played a quick video, which clearly to me didn't even look like a tap out from Leo Rush at all. And now oh. he's walking around with the Cruiserweight Championship from AAA claiming that he is still the official Cruiserweight Champion. I think something eventually is going to unfold more with that. They even mentioned the Championship Committee might be involved with thing, decisions like that coming up as well too. So I think we're going to see something yeah. more unfold. But, man, this matchup with Gringo Loco, I guess the Rado kid is now healing it up, possibly, with this whole not conceding his championship. He kind of acted more heel-like in the ring than we've ever seen from him before. And Gringo Loco is almost too goofy to ever come across as a heel at the same time. This match honestly went a little too long for what it was between these two competitors, as most Gringo Loco matches I've noticed do. They really give this guy <laughs> more ring time than anybody else on the damn roster. Yeah, and you're talking about modern day Gringo Loco. Like he used to be more of a player in the years past. Uh, when I've been watching this, uh, they, the, he was a contender for that middleweight championship and stuff like that. You re you really wouldn't have liked uh, that time period, Munson. But uh, these days, he's just used as uh, preliminary talent to put over the uh, the sort of uh, mid card wrestlers here. And uh, yeah, Laredo Kid obviously getting a little bit of a push here. We've seen him used in the. Uh, uh, to do jobs in a preliminary capacity a number of times. He, he's obviously more skilled than the, than the typical uh, preliminary wrestler, but uh, I, I like to see him booked in a match, getting a win once in a while. Uh, just off topic for one second here, Munson, there was a recent uh, episode of AEW Wrestling that where the Laredo kid uh, figured into it into some kind of a six-man tag team, and... Uh, the kid actually got the pinfall in the match. I couldn't uh, help but feel a little bit of pride for one of our MLW boys uh, doing a shot up in the up in AEW and getting a pinfall too. Great for him and great for his career. But uh, I think yeah, yeah, it looks like if I'm not mistaken, twice. I think it was back to back episodes. Oh, okay. That I I I, okay. so. I mean again, you, just like you, I don't watch it, so I couldn't confirm it. But yeah, I think I had heard that he actually had a one on one or something the week before okay. or the week after that kind of thing. So he did get two opportunities to be there on television. I mean, great for him. Definitely great for him. And I like Laredo Kid. I mean, he's got some great skill. I'd like to see more of him uh, in AAA for sure, too. Uh, it's just, yeah, I mean, Gringo Loco, I mean, he's fine as a prelim talent, but I just don't think his matches need to go as long as they do at the same uh -oh, time. I you're think frozen, they carry out a little too much for me. Oh, still there. Oh, there you oh, go. You froze, you froze up there. On I think we both froze there for a minute. All good, though. Okay. But, yeah, I was just saying, like, I, I like Laredo Kid, but uh, with Gringo Loco, I mean, his matches just go on a little bit long. He's fine as a prelim talent. I mean, I don't completely dislike the guy. I mean, obviously, he's a very skilled and quite athletic guy. I mean, he does shit that I could never dream of doing, but it's just it's not for me that much. If you're a prelim talent, I don't think your matches need to go 10 to 12 minutes at the same time either when you got other guys finishing them off in seven to eight minutes. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, there was uh, 
Yeah, there was a lot of nice action in this match, though. Uh, uh, the thing about Gringo Loco is he can work that Lucha style, so they like to put him in there with their Mexican talent. And, uh, you know, it's just a natural fit kind of thing. Uh, when Laredo Kid was doing in this match, when Laredo Kid was doing the, he likes to do that uh, springboard top row per Corona type thing. He did a couple of those on uh, Gringo Loco. They looked pretty good. And then that finish being a top rope Spanish fly, uh, not the easiest move in the world to uh, to pull off. And you need the full cooperation of your opponent without looking like he's cooperating. They did this pretty good too. So yeah, I- I'm with you. I'm not too sure about Gringo Loco. I get s- sort of a small kick out of him because it's funny, I suppose. But uh yeah, for me, he uh, he's uh, a job guy that can work with uh, Lucha Libre talent and uh, do that style. And uh, okay, it works for me, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, there might be a pl- real good place for Gringo Loco coming up very soon that we'll talk about later on in the show here. But we'll get to that, though. Uh, so Laredo Kid picking up a big win. So great to see him get a win under his belt in MLW. Again, I like Laredo Kid. I think we could see a lot of great stuff from him. I want to see more from him. I especially got a, you know, props to his match earlier in the year with Zenshi. Uh, I think they had two encounters there. I enjoyed both of those two because, I mean, our boy Zenshi kind of miss him. I don't know where he's been, Pop Smokes. I wish he'd come back yeah. already. Zenshi, if yeah. you're listening, get your ass back to MLW this July. Uh, from there, after that one, we went to Hammerstone having an uh, interview with Alicia Atu. And man, he is one pissed off Hammerstone now. Joseph, Sam- Joseph Samael uh, protecting that championship, as we mentioned last time. Basically saying that Hammerstone has no chance of getting that opportunity against Jacob Fatu, that he's not going to allow it. Hammer is pissed off. He wants to do something about it. He wants to you know, get that opportunity that he so so deserves at this point. And he is not uh, not playing very nice here. He's not happy. He wants he wants this chance, and he's being held back. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing about uh, fighting an entire uh, faction by yourself. Uh, he, he's going up against Contra, and they've got, as they say, the global domination. They've got soldiers everywhere, but most importantly, they've got Joseph Samael as their leader. And like we discussed on the previous episode. Uh, uh, He's gatekeeping that world championship title and uh, keeping it around Joe, uh, Jacob Fatu's waist. And uh, if Joseph Samuel sees a, a number one contender that looks a little too scary, looks maybe a little uh, like he might be a threat to uh, Fatu actually losing that belt, then he's not going to approve the match and he's going to steer Fatu away from him. And like we said before, too, Fatu ain't scared of anybody. Like He won't duck a match uh, against anybody. He'd fight King Kong if he had to, but uh, Samael, just not the not the same guy as him. Uh, he's, he's devious. He's very smart, and he's just not going to put Fatu in those situations where there's a possibility that that title might be lost to Contra. So, uh, again, great stuff. Uh, Hammerstone showing a bunch of fire in this promo, and uh, quite good shows that he's not just the uh gym rat and the muscle head and all that he's got some brains he's got some emotion and he knows how to cut a good promo yeah you bet man but you know all might not be lost for hammerstone just yet as the next announcement came from alicia too following this one saying that the battle riot which i I, i'm sure you can probably tell a little bit more if you've seen a battle riot from mlw i'm assuming this is a battle royal that the mlw does and i'm assuming that the winner is going to get an opportunity at the champion no matter what Joseph Samuel says. Yeah, yeah. I, I I have not seen one before. I'm assuming it's a Royal Rumble type thing or a bunkhouse stampede or a battle royal type thing. And yeah, I think Alicia even said that, that the uh, the winner of Battle Riot automatically receives a, a, or is guaranteed a world title shot. So that also makes it all interesting to it. Uh, coming to watch this in the in the following months uh, leads me to wonder how they'll book this because uh, Hammerstone is already the number one contender. I mean, he doesn't really have to win it, but maybe he does have to win it if Samael's going to keep ducking him for Fatu. So I'm not sure how it's going to go. I mean, a lot of fans will just assume that Hammerstone's going to win this thing, but so maybe they'll throw a a wrench in the works too. Who knows? But I'll be interested to see it. 
to get 40 guys in one match, they are going to have to uh, swell up that uh, roster a little bit. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. And I, I mean, I got to play devil's advocate because right away I thought, you know, with the idea that Hammerstone already has earned that championship matchup that he keeps getting held back from. And the fact that you think for sure this is his opportunity He's going to get screwed. I figure it's going to come down to him and one other talent. You figure, no doubt in your mind, Hammerstone's picking up this win. Joseph Samael sends in either a new member of Contra or somebody like Mods Kruger pulls Alexander Hammerstone up and over, you know, getting the assist. The win goes to the other person, someone who Jacob fought to can maul over, completely destroy, continue to hold that title while still building this whole animosity between Hammerstone and the members of Contra, particularly Joseph Samael, who continues to hold him back. And we'll have to wait even longer for another opportunity where Hammerstone earns that championship matchup. Yeah, entirely possible scenario from uh, Munson the Booker there. I could see that happening too. Uh, well, we'll see how it goes. But I mean, we know eventually Hammerstone has to get his championship match one way or another. So uh, from there, MLW, uh, big news uh, with them now on Vice TV. They've had a couple of shows over there and Court Bauer say, stating that MLW on Vice is going to be a different feel to MLW Fusion. So we're going to get kind of two different shows from the MLW brand. As a result, they need to beef up the roster and starting next week, I guess, which is coming up this week as we're recording there's going to be an mlw draft so it sounds like they're going to be drafting in uh, new competitors guys that are currently there obviously all the champions have already been drafted to the roster uh they're going to be looking for picking up new talent i think we're going to see some names especially possibly some names that have not been on tv recently or maybe have been even released from tv recently is another possibility heading to mlw in this draft papa smokes yeah, yeah, the, the tongues will be wagging about this draft for sure. And I'm also uh, thinking of the vast possibilities. It's like we've been uh, reviewing MLW for the better part of a year now. And uh, we watched just in that time, watched the, uh, the, uh, this show and this company uh, growing before our eyes, especially in the last couple months with deals with uh, Fight Network and, and, uh, and uh, Vice TV. And also uh, some of the uh, collaborations they're doing with other wrestling federations too. So really the, the sky's the limit to, as to who they could maybe uh, be looking at drafting. And it's, it's boggling my mind a little bit because I think this is now going to be a hot spot for, uh, for high-level wrestlers to want to go if they can't make uh, the two other big feds that are on TV, uh, uh, this will be a great place. Uh, MLW might be able to pick up some really tasty talent uh, during this draft. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as we were saying this, I just kind of thought about it. And like I said about the recent release talents and stuff like that, but I think they do still have a 90 day non-compete clause, which puts them to around July. So about the time MLW comes back to television for the new season would be about that time. So I can't imagine they'd be allowed to do any draft announcements with anybody like maybe a Samoa Joe or somebody like that. But I can yeah. honestly see a Samoa Joe making an appearance when MLW returns to television. That would be a great location for a guy like him. Oh, and, and think of, of that example. Think of the feuds that he could have in MLW, including uh, filthy Tom Waller and Jacob Fatu and, yeah. uh, ACH and King Mo and all those guys. I mean, they're, that'd be really, really uh, one of the best guys you could possibly get. Yeah, if, and if he could get them, I mean, watch out to the uh, other big feds and stuff like that because I think Samoa Joe, at this point especially, has enough of that star power to carry over with him to a company like that, especially if they push him like the, you know, the big talent that he deserves to be and everything and not keep him on the sidelines as a uh, announcer. As good as he is as a talker, I want to see Samoa Joe kicking ass in the ring. Yeah, he's got time left. The, the Samoan submission machine would, would be an absolute uh, boon to MLW. His style would fit right in the way it's uh, it's uh, an MMA-based uh, submission wrestling style. I mean, yeah, just some of the guys I just named, think of all the talent that would fit in perfectly with Samoa Joe. Uh, that, that, that would be uh, one, of the, one of the dream acquisitions, in my opinion. Yeah. And I mean, there, there was other talent released as well too, but most, uh, a lot of it was the, uh, 
women's division talent, which MLW doesn't have a whole lot of uh, going on. They don't really have the uh, ladies matches like we've talked about in the past from other companies. I don't know if that would be a change for them, if they would go down that route at this point, if they would start introducing them. I, I think maybe they're fine as they are, like the, the women of MLW that work there right now do great at what they're doing and stuff, and they've trusted them, especially Selena De La Renta with produ- production and everything like that. I, d- I don't know if necessarily they need to bring them in for talents for doing wrestling matches at this point, but I'm not sure. I mean, if it was done right, sure, I could get behind it. I'm just not sure if they need to get a big influx of talent that uh, hasn't been built solely over time. Yeah, that and uh, if you've been watching the news, you noticed that uh, just this past week, Ring of Honor started a women's division and then they're going to they're gonna probably get a bunch of the uh, top talent that hasn't already been snatched up by the major feds. So you, who knows, you might see uh, Allison Kay, Marty Bell, those kinds of uh, good, solid lady talents uh, showing up in, in Ring of Honor then that kind of thins it out for what might be available for MLW. I've never heard that MLW has any plans for a ladies division, but I can imagine they might be thinking of it. That That is one of the uh, hotter trends in pro wrestling right now is that ladies wrestling is, is getting hot and uh, has a lot of fans and they're getting some, uh, some workers that are really, really good in the ring and, and getting experience and trained well and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, I, I, it, I haven't heard anything about that, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did uh, start to make a foray into having a ladies division as well. Yeah, it would be interesting to see because, I mean, again, you got to you got to quite the roster to have to fill up if they're going to be doing two different shows. They're going to want to be able to bring out lots of different talent <clears throat> over the over those shows and everything like that. I mean, even with MLW Fusion, you don't usually see the same guys two weeks in a row very often. Uh, they try to mix it up quite a bit, and that's with you know a smaller roster, a one hour a week show. We don't, we really don't know at this point what MLW on Vice is going to look like once it gets to its own uh, look and feel and everything too. So once that kind of unfolds and we see how this draft unfolds, I think we're going to be seeing those interesting surprises and looking forward to what they have in store for us. Uh, so we'll we'll get to how that unfolds. We'll probably do a review of that uh, draft down the line here on uh, Ring Respect as well too. So we'll be looking forward to watching that seeing what uh, goes down with MLW in the background as we head into the new season. Uh, after this, though, after this announcement, we had an interview with the Von Erichs back home. Marshall Von Erich is on uh, crutches, looking pretty pretty rough there, but he says that he's going to heal up. He's going to get better, get back to training. Uh, he's still fiery. He's ready to go when the time is right. He's, he's plans to come back and kick the shit out of Tom Lawler. There's no doubt about that. He says he's got Texas and Hawaii behind him, and he's ready to get in there and uh, – really do some ass kicking that's uh, long overdue. Yeah. And when he says that, I believe him, he's the, he's the more fiery and a uh, little bit wilder of the two Von Eric brothers. Uh, when he says he's going to kick somebody's ass, uh, I believe him. Yeah, me too, man. Looking forward to the day. Uh, from there, we had our second match of the night. After all that, believe it or not, we actually got some in-ring action. Uh, Richard Holiday, the Caribbean champion, uh, now a babyface Richard Holiday taking on Ariel Dominguez, who I think we've seen as a prelim talent previously on episodes of MLW Fusion. Uh, Ariel Dominguez does a nice job as a prelim talent and, again, did a great job working here with Richard Holiday. Holiday able to get in there looking like, you know, looking like a champion, being treated like a champion now, making that Caribbean championship actually kind of have a little bit more meaning than it did maybe previously when Richard Holiday first possessed it. And uh, doing a lot more with him and a lot more with this title. I, I really like what I've seen here from Richard Holiday. Uh, again, it's, it's a prelim match. It did what it needed to do. It got Richard Holiday that uh, win that he needs to really uh, boost him up even more. What do you think, Papa Smokes? Yeah, I, I can't uh, disagree with you there. Uh, like we've said in the past a number of times, it seems like uh, Richard Holiday needs that big match or that big moment to really break him free and, and, and make him into sort of a, a main event superstar guy or a guy approaching the main event status. And uh, this match, I think uh, even though it was a uh, minute 36 long and was against Ariel Dominguez, a much, much smaller opponent than uh, Richard holiday. I still think this was nice match in order to push uh, Richard holiday uh, very short, Holiday worked slow and deliberate. Like he, he worked, he looked like a a champion, like a world champion, just so confident, so slow, 
every move measured, every move done perfectly and to, to devastate young Dominguez. And uh, he hit that uh, 2008 market crash, uh, spinning suplex and got the pinfall quickly in this match. Really just looking good. And uh, I see big things for this guy. I, I could see him going all the way to heavyweight champion at some point if his uh, career goes the right way, if he avoids injury and if uh, he continues to get the good booking that he gets in MLW. Yeah, and one thing I noticed too is, man, has he got some size to him, especially when you put him up against an Ariel Dominguez, who is a much smaller talent, but you can only tell Richard Holiday has a good uh, good physique, good size and everything, but when you put him in there with a guy like this, who I'm sure Ariel Dominguez would match up size for size with most guys in the independents and some other feds we're quite aware of, um, Richard Holiday looks like a fucking wrestler, <laughs> which is nice to see in this day and age. Yeah, absolutely, and he's a uh... What is he, 6'3", 235, something like that? He's a good-sized guy. He looked like an absolute giant in this match, but he's uh, he, he looks good. He, his body is, is always awesome and uh, muscular and in shape and all that. He looks like a million bucks. Uh, uh, no pun intended for his character that's uh, always concerned with uh, riches and money and all, and all that. And uh, it might be kind of hard to to have his uh, his gimmick, so to speak, uh, be a babyface type thing because he looks down his nose at the consumers and he breathes the rarefied air and all that stuff all the time. But uh, if he's going to make an extended uh, babyface push, uh, I still think he'll get over just because uh, uh, he's good in the ring. He looks good. And uh, yeah, like you say, he looks like a real wrestler. And he, I mean, he has a the ability to kind of make you chuckle at a few things that he does too. And I think For I sure. think that's where it'll work as a baby face. I think you can take this gimmick and kind of flip it around. He obviously moves merchandise for them. You see a lot of people really engaging him and talking to him online and stuff like that. And he plays the character up even online. He's, he plays it up quite well and stuff like that. He's a guy that doesn't, doesn't appear to me like he breaks kayfabe a whole lot. He stays well in character. He enjoys it. And I like to see that. And I think, again, with his ability to market these products and stuff that he's selling and everything, and the fact that they are selling proves there's something to be said about a babyface run for Richard Holiday. I like that it's going that way. And I mean, I think MLW could use an influx of good babyface guys going into the new season as well, too. I'm glad Richard Holiday is going to be getting that little bit of a push, as it seems here. Uh, really looking forward to what's in store for him come July. Yeah, and I think it's hard sometimes for a company to have good baby faces because uh, lots of the boys of the wrestlers, so to speak, want to be uh, heels because um, it's easier in a way, right? And it, it's easier to be an asshole than to be a nice guy, as I've heard a lot of wrestlers say. So uh, a lot of them gravitate towards that heel role. But uh, yeah, I think you're right with the, with the humor and the, uh, the cut downs and the insults that he uses and such, I, th I think holiday will or could be an effective baby face and uh I, I look for uh, big things with him i wonder what will happen with this caribbean championship at some point because it, he obviously uh, attained that through uh, nefarious means and such but he's still holding on to it and all these questions will be answered in the future but i, I think the future is bright for richard holiday yeah and speaking of big things he went on backstage to uh have an interview with his on again, off again, Canadian crush, Alicia Toot. So yes, she's interviewing Richard Holiday backstage talking about his big win as uh, all of a sudden Gino Medina comes walking in. He interrupts things. He wants another opportunity at that Caribbean championship. He is not done with Richard Holiday made very clear here. Richard Holiday kind of laughing him off, shoving him aside, you know, away with you kind of thing. And Richard Holiday paid the ultimate price. He had his back turned to his, to his uh, opponent here, and Gino Medina went on the attack, uh, really laid a holiday out, and again, leaving a bit of a cliffhanger in what they're calling the season finale. So now we've built up this animosity still between these two guys after uh, Richard Holiday getting the clean win over Gino Medina recently in the Caribbean Championship match, now building the idea that Gino Medina wants to go out there, and we're going to get the uh, maybe that heel match heel versus babyface matchup that we really didn't get the first time around when these guys fought. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to look at it too. And this is another uh, feud that they started before the COVID lockdown back in uh, 2019. This started when uh, uh, Holiday's faction, the uh, the dynasty, was welcoming a new member when uh, Maxwell Jacob Friedman left. They uh, wanted to get a new member, so they had picked Gino Medina, and uh, he was going to be.